and welcome to today's webinar, Creating Immersive Events Through Storytelling. Let's face it, we've all been to events that were, well, forgettable, but what if we could create experiences that people actually remember and talk about? That's where storytelling comes in. Over the next hour, we'll dive into the art of crafting narratives that resonate, evoke emotions, and leave a lasting impression. Together, we'll learn how to design events that your audience will never forget. So let's get started. First off, I'm Lauren, the marketing manager at ExpoPass, and I'll be guiding our discussion today. If you've attended an ExpoPass webinar before, welcome back. For those who have not and aren't familiar with ExpoPass, we are an event technology platform providing event organizers like you with a suite of tools for planning, tracking, and hosting events of all kinds. ExpoPass is here to simplify your life as an organizer. If you'd like to learn more, you'll find the link to our website in the chat, so check us out. Let me make sure that I open up the chat for everybody. There we go. Um, before we start, a few things to go over. Today's event is an open discussion that we'd love for you to be a part of. So please use the chat to ask any questions as we go or ask questions using the Q&A box. In the chat, you will all see, see Cassie from the ExoPass team to help answer some questions and drop any of these links along the way. We are recording this session and it'll be available for you to watch on demand later. Let me make sure the chat. Okay. I have everyone. Okay. It says chat's open. Maybe someone give us a little test just to make sure. I want to make sure that the chat, everyone can see. Make sure you can get a link. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Okay, cool. Is that working? Sorry, just want to make sure. I see that we have, that was Devin. Okay. Just give me a note. I'll have Cassie reach out to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Our chat. Okay. If anything. The Q&A box is working well. Q&A box. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Q&A. Chat is disabled. Okay. Thank you. No, that's good. We want to have an update. Although on my end, I have chat is available to everyone. Everyone. Let's see. But no one else still disabled. Ooh, okay. We might have to use the Q&A because I'm not quite sure that tech error here with the chat, but feel free to type in the Q&A to please uh, engage with us and ask questions. Okay. Okay, cool. So use the q and I'm glad that works and let's, <clears throat> let's get started. Okay. First up too, I want to introduce you our two lovely speakers with us today. First, we have Anthony Vade. He's a seasoned event professional with over 20 years of experience designing and executing memorable events worldwide. As an instigator and change agent, he helps clients create meaningful connections with their audiences. Based in Toronto, Anthony is the event experience strategy director at Encore where he continues to push the boundaries of event design. Welcome, Anthony. Hey. Next up, we have Devin Pasha. She is a passion event professional with a focus on creating meaningful and impactful experiences. As the director of North America for the Event Design Collective and the owner of DMP Creative, she specializes in adding value to events through MC and speaking services. Devin leverages design thinking and empathy to craft engaging experiences that align with her clients' goals. Welcome, Devin and Anthony. We're thrilled to have you both today for today's event. Okay, so now let's jump right in. I'm going to pop up a poll real fast to get us started. So please, yeah, give me, a, yeah, in the Q&A, hopefully you can see the poll, just launched it. And as mm -hmm. uh, perfect, the votes keep coming in. We want to know, yeah, what's your biggest challenge when trying to create immersive event experiences just to get a gauge on where everybody's at? And so far, yeah, keep them coming. As they keep coming in, let's get started with the basics. How do you define an immersive event and what key elements differentiate it from a traditional event in terms of event design? Devin, you want well, to- I'm going to dive in. Yeah, I think what's really important is that we start off by defining what an event is. Uh, it's really great because we all come at that from maybe different perspectives. But if we start with the baseline that an event is any gathering of two or more people or groups of people that changes behavior. So I'll say that again. It's any gathering of two or more people or groups of people that changes behavior. And when we talk about change behavior, we're talking 
talking about pulling levers of change, sharing knowledge, giving skills, sharing attitudes, or meeting people. And when you go to an event with that perspective, it really helps you understand how to, um, if you understand what that change behavior is, how can you use immersive events or immersive storytelling to help get you to that end result? Nice. So perfectly put. And I, I, I'll build on that a little bit. So if we can all agree that that there needs to be that behavior changes, tempting to fall into the trap of just thinking immersive as what we see a lot in that business to consume a marketplace. So it's a bit more familiar to us. Some of us have been to theme parks where we get immersed in a story like the Disney intergalactic star cruiser story heavily, heavily involved. I uh, may, may have gone to see immersive Van Gogh. There's some amazing projection mapping experiences out there. Uh, Mia Wolf, uh, Area 15, all the different activations all over uh, North America now where you can go into Omega Mart and experience larger than life type uh, immersive experiences. Um, but they're, they're happening in the B2B business to business world as well as we look at our events when we're gathering these two or more people and asking how do we really put that attendee at the center of the experience immersed right that attendee is immersed in that moment and uh, how do we elicit an emotional response from them through that experience that we put them in. And we can then start to look at then scale and scope from that point to understand. And I like that we talked about storytelling already because I think the simplest, the cheapest tool that we have in our arsenal to connect with human emotions and to put that event attendee at the center is the story that we tell them and the story that we craft around them. Nice, thank you, yeah. I'm gonna also share some of our poll results on the poll. Share yeah. with everyone. No, I'm curious. Yeah, Instagram's uh, app. Budget and engagement, yeah. Yeah, so would you guys say that's pretty common in your experience? Yeah, that you're seeing some of them organizers having these challenges, yeah. Especially if we think about immersive as being the big experiences, right? If we think about yeah. the theatrical, the big technology activations, the large space, uh, then your budget comes into play. Uh, yeah. Difficulty engaging audiences, I, I think that could get unpacked a lot because, yeah. when, you know, is, is it the audience we're having difficulty engaging with? Is it the event owners who are apprehensive about how immersive things are? Um, I think lack of time is an interesting one, as many of us, the idea of doing an immersive event and having to put the extra work into crafting that experience. That just sounds like it's going to take time away time. from the work that we have to do. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I feel like, yeah. Number one, engaging the audience. We want to be having yeah. them immersed, engaged. Um, okay, great. So how does storytelling serve as the foundation for creating an immersive experience within the context of event design? And we'd love, you know, some examples of how, yeah events you've been to or that you've hosted um utilize storytelling to enhance that i think anthony said it best when we were talking about emotions right so when you think about where storytelling comes from when you go way back from a human-centric perspective storytelling is how we shared histories right oral history was the first way that we included each other that we felt like we belonged to our tribe our family our histories and that storytelling culture is ingrained in all of us um so when you think about really wanting to have events that engage when you want to have them be and have lasting impressions you need to figure out a way to touch on more than just what they're seeing the best way from a neuroscience perspective that you can have memories last and be deeply anchored is to have an emotional connection. And one of the best ways to get that emotional connection is through stories, because it really helps us all connect with that human to human perspective. So whether it's B2C, whether it's B2B, whether you're small not-for-profit, whether you're megacorp, the story itself is what has each person as a singular entity connect and really get that emotional response. And so I think that and there's lots of ways to do that. And I'll let Anthony kind of jump in with, with more perspectives. But if you think about even silly things, so um, from a nerdy perspective, I'm a Ren Faire geek, you know, self-admitted. And the idea is that there's always a story that starts. It's where are you in history? What is the story of the day? How can you follow that through? What can I wear that will allow me to participate in that so I feel that I'm a part of this singular community? And that's really what events are, especially immersive storytelling events, is what you're doing is creating in a bubble for a moment this micro community and everyone wants 
to feel that they belong. And the story helps them weave that magic to go into that space and stay immersed in that space. Um, and really the whole time feel that they can participate with, be a part of, and help even move the story forward. I mean, you're in my my sweet spot. This is the the, the, the topic that I love to talk about the most. Uh, so almost baiting me into this. Uh, and I'll hold back a little bit for the sake of the audience. I don't want to get too deep in into the biology behind this. We'll, like, we'll keep um, him reeled in a little bit. Guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to control me. Otherwise, the, the whole thing will just be talking about the neuroscience of storytelling and why it works. Um, but I, uh, viewers out there, grab a pen and paper. I'm going to give you a couple of quick things that you can go and research afterwards if you want to get into that level of geek. Um, Paul Zach, an amazing researcher, academic, uh, and one of the, I believe, one of the founding members of the Future of Storytelling Conference, where they explore storytelling narrative formats, did a fantastic study with DARPA on the neurology of storytelling and why it works. And what they found is, and why it's so connected to our evolution, when we tell each other stories, we release the same chemicals in our brains that get released as, as, as experiencing that moment. In, in real life. Um, and this is an evolutionary trait that, that, that helped us survive when, you know, saber tooth cats were coming to get us. We had to have an, a visceral emotional response to the story so that we would learn from it. And so that if we did get into that scenario in the future, we weren't killed by the saber tooth cat. And this thing's carried over because we spent about 2 million years at that best guess. Um, of various stages of evolution using storytelling. It's only really been 7,000 years that we started writing stuff down. And even then, we didn't do a lot of storytelling. We did a lot of accounting for a long time. So that, that oral history has been, been a huge part of it, which is why it's so deeply ingrained in, into these experiences. Uh, I'll give you your second thing that could be useful. We think about storytelling as being a bit daunting too, like I'm not a novelist, um, but there's so many storytelling structures that have been tested, trialed out there. The obvious one is the hero's journey, and I'll give you a quick example that some of you may have experienced. Uh, if we think of Star Wars, that follows a very well-defined hero's journey format, but... Um, Something you can pick up is a 52 card deck called Storytellers Tactics out of Pip Decks, an amazing, amazing innovative group. This has 52 different structures that you can apply to your story above and beyond just the hero's journey as well. To give you an idea, that's, that's just one example, 52 different formats you can use. Like storytelling is, is very accessible and very approachable if you look at it from, from a perspective of, I need to provide some structure in my story in order to unlock the brains and to get the right chemicals firing at the right time. Nice, oh, I love that. Okay, we'll be sure, yeah, either to drop the link to those cards or we'll mm -hmm. definitely in our recap um, article, what a great resource. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, cool. Awesome. So maybe, and our chat is enabled. So yes, <laughs> make sure to let everyone know we are back in the chat. So feel free to drop anything in there. I'm excited. To um, and I will just note, you know, Anthony and I are clearly both nerds on certain subjects, but for those of you who are in any type of event design, planning, strategy, I can't recommend enough, like just find at a local university or, or community college neuroscience 101. If, if it's like, it is such an impactful way to just give yourself a little bit of extra knowledge and edge to understand because we all plan for human beings and it's really nice to know how they work. And you don't need to know the whole biology perspective, but from a neuro perspective, and there's a lot of research in this, a lot of great white papers that we can help share as well on colors, on tastes, on sights, on smells, which I know we're going to get to in a moment, but this idea of if you understand how memories are formed, if you understand how written word and pictures and oral communication and what you take in through your optic nerves can affect memories, if you understand how people can be creative and share ideas with you, it's like if you want to have a car, you kind of want to know how it works. Well, when you're dealing with people, I can't recommend enough. Just, you know, even like a neuro one on one book, if you're if you're, you know, a, a reader nerd, but um I can't recommend enough. Just, just, you know, either some YouTube videos or even just, just treat yourself to a class and just see how impactful and how you can kind of use that to scaffold your own knowledge on how, on how you use that and just add a little something to your toolbox. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. That is a perfect segue too into uh, my next question about what strategies do you guys use to deeply engage your attendees? So after, yeah, getting to know a little bit more about your attendees, how do you engage um, and make them active participants in the story within the framework of event design? What about if I give you one in context to an experience that we created? And 
brag, 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 an award, an award winning uh, experience that, that we crafted. Um, some of you may have attended IMAX uh, Las Vegas back in uh, 2022 uh, uh, and may have gone through the Encore Break Free experience. Um, this is a pretty, pretty cool example because one, it was fairly fairly structured around the hero's journey. Uh, everybody turned up as individuals, uh, as an event plan or as, as an IMAX goer. Uh, they, they met somebody at the counter. So we immediately had a human connection there to put them at ease and give them some psychological safety. So we needed to get a base level uh, of their emotional state. They needed to feel comfortable. We then introduced them to somebody that made it a little bit awkward again, right? Make them a bit uncomfortable, but sort of said, okay, tell each other your stories. So we immediately made them feel that they needed to be a storyteller at that point, that it wasn't just about the experience. We had them wait. We ushered the first group into the first room that we welcomed them into, just a big drape uh, black box. We had this soundscape in there that was noisy traffic because we wanted to explore what is the uh, challenges in the events industry. We wanted people to feel a bit uncomfortable about sustainability, problems with diversity, equity and inclusion. And we weren't going to make them feel something if it didn't feel uncomfortable a little bit and make it feel very important. So we had graphics up on on these digital artwork poster boards that we had where there was trash and the lighting was like green and, and purple and icky. And you just, you, everyone's like, it feels gross in here. And we tend to run away from that kind of stuff when we create experiences. The idea of actively making people feel sick, in, especially in the corporate world, we try to avoid it. But we knew to set up this story, we needed that first hero's journey moment to instigate that you need to do something serious here, that this is a real challenge and we need to elicit a negative response in you so we can then cure you later on in the journey. We made them sit in this uncomfortable space with uncomfortable music and uncomfortable lighting and navigate uncomfortable conversations with each other as storytellers. Then we revealed a moment, the drape opened up, nice little bit of smoke machine. We had fragrance machines. So olfactory sensors were being uh, unleashed in the next room. We ushered them into the next room. We had a big video projection moment with some more storytelling that basically said to them, hey, you're the heroes here. Next step on your journey, cross a threshold with us. You, through this quick story, one minute story that, that you're going to hear, you can now be the protagonist uh, to solve this, this challenge. Will you join us in that? And if you will, the LED video wall rose up and we invited them to literally cross that hero's journey threshold into the next space. And they went and met some, uh, some, some supernatural beings, some advisors, some guides for the next step of their process. So we got them through the first half of the hero's journey structure. We did it by making them feel a bit uncomfortable, release some of those hormones. Mm -hmm. We made them the storytellers of that journey that they were gonna go on. And then we invited them to continue it with us afterwards. So really put them at the center of that story from, from the very beginning, and then very intentionally hit these key touch points with them through multi sensory experiences that would lead to them having some behavior change afterwards. Love it. I actually had the opportunity to experience that too. I thought that was as, I, as did I. Yep. Yeah. And when I when yeah. I connected with Anthony, I was like, no way. Like I actually have been to that um experience at IMAX. So I was like, I remembered it. See, it was memorable as something I had never experienced before. Hmm. And well, we're like person. three weeks away. Wait till you see what we've got coming to IMAX yeah. this year. So plug, plug, plug. Well, the great story about that too is what is impactful versus what is change behavior. And mm -hmm. the context that I happen to know is that originally they were just going to do a cool LED wall with a waterfall. Oh. And it was, okay, so, but like, because you want to talk about change behavior or sustainability or like whatever the original context was, it's like, we'll have like one of the coolest LED waterfalls. And it's like, okay. That looks pretty. What what am I supposed to do with that? What is the call to action? What is the change behavior if I look at a waterfall? Is that just supposed to be a natural moment? But but again, if it's just something hanging on the wall with no context, with no story, you can't engage the user. And there's an excellent question in the chat, if I may, that says, how can you do something like that without a huge budget? And if you listen to the story, yes, they had projection mapping, and yes, they had writers, and yes, they had digitals, and they had smoke machines and fog machines and lights. But if you listen to it, it was, how do you give someone a sense of psychological safety when they join something unknown? How do you tell a story which makes them the protagonist so they see themselves as part of the story? How do you make them 
Uh, and again, you don't always have to make them slightly uncomfortable, but we grow from places of slight discomfort because that's where growth comes from. So if you're asking your guests to take a step of growth or a leap of faith, you do have to put them in a slight place of discomfort but always reminding them that you'll get them safely to the end of the other side. So giving them that sense of safety, because most of us, you know, from a neuro perspective, when they see something unknown, it's that there may, may be a saber tooth cat behind the other side of that curtain and something inside me is saying, I don't want to be attacked by a saber tooth cat. So I'm a little uncomfortable. Again, fear of the unknown, but you say, we're going to take you through all the way to the end. It builds that sense of trust. All of those things that we're sharing with you right now, none of those have to cost money. All of those have to do with maybe a good script writer. And um, all of you have access to a free script writer. It's called ChatGPT. You can take your basic ideas. You can put a great prompt in for free and say, hey, can you help me craft a compelling story? How does that turn into a script? What type of voice should I use? You can, um, so again, like a lot of us have access to basic lights, okay? Lights, um, uh, different colors evoke different emotions. So are you trying to make them uncomfortable? Are you trying to keep them calm? Are you trying to get people revved up? Different types of music that you have access to. All of these things don't have to cost a lot of money and can be incredibly impactful. So just, just keep that in mind. And also you probably have a great story within your organization. You know, who's, who's the change maker? Tell the story, tell the great story and just let people see themselves. I wanna see that I'm making an impact with the work that I do for this organization. Here's the impact. Here's a direct impact story. So again, just because we're sharing examples that do have the ability to have a lot of budget, what we're trying to show you is that the underlying change behavior is none of these things have to cost money, but here's how you get to that desired change with things like immersion and with things like storytelling. Mm, I love that. <laughs> I'll give you one more piece. There's, there's a temptation when addressing innovation as a whole. And I think we're talking about innovating how we deliver experiences and events here. The temptation with innovation is to think about all the boundaries and constraints that you have that I don't have the budget, I don't have the time. And, and instead of taking a step back and looking at and, and going, okay, I have an organization that has thought leaders within it. They're okay at telling stories. I know they have stories to tell. But with a little bit of coaching, I can make their stories better or I can find someone to come in and help coach them on their scripting so the stories fit a better formula, they, they're a more reliable formula perhaps, and they can be a more compelling speaker. The biggest, cheapest option you have for, ca for capturing multiple senses, well, the two things, you're already paying for video, probably mm -hmm. in your rooms, so you use it. Use it appropriately to, to Devin's point, use some of that color theory stuff, play to that. It's already there. You already paid for it. F few, throw a few extra bucks in and don't use Microsoft Clip Art. That's my recommendation. Second one is audio. You already have speakers in the space for the microphones. And I tell you, there's been some amazing moments during my career just by picking the right soundtrack whether to bring energy into the room, to pick people up as they walk in, to show separation between different sessions with different energy shifts and changes. Um, a great example, we were working with a bunch of uh, very senior financial executives, um, very intelligent, very wealthy people, uh, and they had big problems with, they just want to network, they, they just want to hang out in the foyer space and we can never get them into the general session room. I said, well, let's let's make it a bit more immersive let's make it a moment so we had the moment where the ballroom doors opened up we had some music playing inside that was a bit once again a bit edgy it wasn't your traditional safe background music it had a bit of ambient weirdness to it and we made the lights in the foyer slowly sort of throb and the lights built up in the main ballroom and they all curiosity sparked them and they went hang on this isn't normal this isn't the standard pattern of what this event's been and the entire I think there was 300 of them turned around, walked into the into the ballroom and sat down in absolute silence. We'd allocated 15 minutes to them being seated. They were seated in under five and the entire team's like, oh, no, quick, get the talent ready. We've got to go early <laughs> because it worked too well. Um, and that wasn't any additional investment other than sitting down with the event organizer, picking a track during the sound check. And then just having a bit of theatrical cueing to sort of show them that this transition moment was coming and show that it was, say, the start of the chapter of that story that we were about to tell. And then from that point on, they just followed what we told them to do. Thanks. Wow. So, yeah, you both have mentioned some uh, key elements when building, you know, an immersive event. Are there any additional ones that you'd like to point out that you think are 
pretty critical to creating a compelling and believable world. Um, yeah. Well, it's, you know, and Anthony said, it's all about senses and, yeah. you know, we live and breathe in and to survive based on these tactile things that we have. It's one of the first things you learn in school, right? What are your five senses? Because it's so important to how we exist and interact with our world. And the more senses that are included in an experience, the stronger the memory that can be formed because there's more parts of the brain that is activating and has things to latch onto. You know, if you, everyone in the chat just thinks about one of the strongest memories they've had in the past year, just, you know, you can think about it, you can throw it in the chat, just like something you can automatically go to. I guarantee you there was a strong emotional moment that went with that. I can guarantee you probably remember what it smelled like outside. You can probably remember what you were eating at the time. Um, you can probably remember there was maybe a particular sound of, you know, there's birds or traffic. You could probably go back to that moment and feel that again and understand what senses were engaged when you had that moment. Um, and that's really one of the ways you can think about, think about and empathize with the group that's coming in. What do you know about them? And think about how you can use all the things you have at your disposal. Um, scent is a really big part of events right now. And a lot of us don't take that as seriously as we should, because really, you know, it, do you need to make people hungry? You know, like all of a sudden, if you smell something delicious or spicy, or you smell the coffee coming from the outside, all of a sudden you're like, Ooh, I'm engaged. I'm, I'm perked up. I'm ready to go. Um, there are some hotels that have signature scents and you walk in and there's a signature scent. As soon as you walk in, you're like, oh, I'm in a place that I'm familiar and I like. And then you search out that familiarity. Um, I had an experience once I walked into a random restaurant, a random city. I was traveling and it was a French Vietnamese restaurant. And for whatever reason, that restaurant smelled exactly like my great grandmother's house. <laughs> I could close my eyes and tell you exactly where it was. And I don't know what that fragrance was, but it was, I know exactly where I am as soon as I, as soon as I smell it, because this is how memories are anchored. Now, for those of you that have a B2B or B2C, generally there's an attitude or something your owner would like to happen after the event. Well, after the event, they have have to go back to a memory to to ascertain did i like that do i want to let's say donate money to your cause do i want to become a member of that organization do i want to purchase that product i have to remember that experience so when you think about invoking those five senses and it includes the food yes of course it includes the food so yes if you have really bad coffee or you didn't feed people properly or if the food was really you know not delightful for whatever reason it's going to be like oh I didn't like that and that's what you anchor versus if I sat down and had a beautiful experience and it smelled like nature and it looked like there was led windows and I felt immersed in a story the more of those things that you have um especially for things like Anthony's event there was something tactile we had to hold an ipad for a second so I got to touch something and I had to interact and so my brain had to look at it I had to absorb the color I had to read the words I had to look at an image I had to touch something I had to share that with another so if you think about in that I think it was like a three minute exchange all the different senses I had to use that's a really quick anchor to that particular memory. And then at the end of the event, we were welcomed into a different, very welcoming, very open, very safe space. And there was a glass of champagne. So now it's celebratory. Now I know when I have champagne, that's a happy moment. We're celebrating something. It's invigorating. It's full of bubbles. I can taste it. I can smell it. So again, going back, it doesn't have to cost a lot, but how many ways are you using the senses to anchor these memories so that when you have to recall them, they're much easier and much stronger? And you set me up so beautifully to build on that, um, because one of the other things that, we, that, that we've been successful with is thinking about that individual experience moment in context to the larger experience. So there's the temptation to think of things insular. I'm going to have a buffet. I'm going to have an award ceremony. I'm going to have breakouts and not really link them up as much as we could. It, it, at least that's the trend that I've seen. We're starting to see a shift in this. Um, to your point about the iPad, in that first room, we made you do stuff and made you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. We made sure we took that iPad away from you after that experience was over to once again signal that transition. And I think it's important as you look at talking about multi-sensory and immersive and big, you know, these big moments, do you allow a bit of white space for recovery? And do you allow them to get away from it? Because if you're constantly inundating them, they're, they're gonna either be overwhelmed and just shut down or they'll actually try to escape your space to get that white space. 
So you have to find balance and you have to think of that immersive experiential moment in context to the overall journey that's happening maybe over the course of the the entire duration, whether it's you know four hours, five hours, three days. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure that like a good DJ, you're playing the right tune that pumps them up at the right time, but then lets them slow dance a little bit later on. We know when they want to be, be a bit more romantic as well. Um, and the last piece that I'll give you as well uh, is is uh, look into biophilia. Big trend. We like mm -hmm. nature. We like plants. Mm -hmm. We like to feel like we're outside, and yet we throw ourselves into these amazing venues all over the world that are big boxes with high ceilings, blank walls, and we lose connection to nature. No windows. No windows. Right. No natural light. Um, and that isn't the kind of immersive environment that we're used to back to our evolutionary psychology side of things. So look at how you can bring some biophilia in, experiment with your spaces. I, I've done some amazing sessions where the audience has been super engaged and immersed in the content and it's been in the foyer where the big windows are because we wanted the natural light. We got rid of projection. We didn't do PowerPoint presentations because we wanted to leverage that biophilia side of things. Nice. You mentioned too, I want to touch on location and how yeah. that event organizers can take advantage of the non-traditional location um, yeah. and different elements. That's such a great question. Um, and actually uh, something I was asked earlier this week about non-traditional spaces. I think a lot of us, you know, we're like, oh, we have to go to the ballroom. And one of the reasons we go is because we're familiar with that format. We know that there's a ballroom. We know that there's tables and chairs, or we know that we can set it up theater style or family style or whatever, you know, there's a stage. We all have to look this way. And because we're familiar with the format, it's easy to put ourselves in that format. So when we see non-traditional venues, it's like, I don't know how I fit in that venue versus how can I use the venue to fit the story, to fit that desire change behavior. So thinking about, we have to do a lot of team building why not look at a ballpark, a football stadium? You know, like this is a place that's about teams. It's about achievement. It's about scoring a goal. So why not think about places that put you in this idea of team, of teamwork, of team achievement? Um, when you're thinking about, you know, something where you need to be immersed in a story, are there locations, historical venues, locations? local venues um, that that help you tell the story that have that sort of visual appeal so you don't have to add too much to it the space itself is already in the vein or in the theme of that story and how can you utilize it to move people in those spaces and again it's like well I can't fit 400 people in that space okay do you need 400 people like let's go back to the beginning a lot of us go in with preconceived notions that this won't work it's like when you think about design and I'll put a plug in for design doesn't take more time design is just how you use your time so if you do some of the design first and you understand that this is the ideal change behavior and this is the ideal group you may find that it's not exactly 400 people that need to be changed in this way maybe it's 100 or 150 or it's 400 over four days and they get to come in different sessions like you can change the format it's okay to take a little bit of a step forward in order to get somewhere new so think about unique spaces think about open public spaces think Think about where's the history and the stories within the city that you're going to and how do you utilize that? Think about what is the local culture? What do they want to showcase and how can that move that desire change behavior forward? So give yourself permission to take a step back and think about what would be an interesting way to move this story forward in order to get to what that change behavior is. And it could be something as simple as inviting a local historian to put you in a space to let you know where you are or where you're standing. Could it be you add a historical walking tour to the lunchtime activity or the post-lunch so everyone can get outside, take a walk, feel the fresh air, hear something interesting and immersive, learn something new while they're in a space where they are really needing to digest and take a break from the stimulation that, that you're giving them. So there's really an opportunity to, again, give yourself permission to think about if we know we want to do this, what are all the ways in which we could and what is at our disposal? And oftentimes, again, going back to cost, it doesn't have to cost more and for a lot of teams, it's like, ooh, we have this really unique space. What are all the ways that we could use it? What are all the touch points? Because it may begin not at the ballroom. It may begin where you park your vehicle. It may begin as you walk into the space. It may begin in the restroom. Anthony and I were joking the other day that like restroom activations are such a missed opportunity because every single one of your attendees will use them at some point. 
And it is a great place to continue the story. Um, and just any type of visuals. I mean, I've done events, corporate events that have costumes. It's like same staff, but just in a different, just in a different outfit. They're doing the same function, but it's like, oh, you're incorporated into the story. Now I feel incorporated into the story. Um, so again, like just thinking through different ways to get yourself out of that ballroom. And again, finding places with nature, finding places with natural light, finding places that are already geared towards um, that immersion that you're looking for. And then it saves you time and money and effort to have to build that from scratch. There's a great opening line in the uh, preface to uh, Event Design Handbook, which is uh, very near and dear to both Devin and I. And I think it was Julius Solarius uh, who, who shares the quote that um, in order to change the behavior of others, you must first change your own. And I think going into event design and we are creatures of habit as a species, as human beings, we like the familiar patterns and we fall into them, but we have fallen into, especially in the corporate or internal business or association market, a bit of a pattern of what an event should look like. Um, and when we have the opportunity to deviate from that, we feel a bit uncomfortable, but it's a really powerful opportunity to bring in some experimentation in some of these areas, whether it's immersive, whether it's networking or whatever it might be. Um, quite often I've been working with groups of late and we look at, okay, you know your main room, the main tent, the big stage, you're comfortable with keynotes, audience is going to sit there in theater style, it's going to be a bit prosaic. You know, they're going to be a bit passive. They're just going to be absorbing information. But what we're encouraging them to do now is when they walk out of that ballroom, when you engaging with them next and, and, and how you encouraging them to become the storytellers of that session. So when we say alternative spaces, can you usher them into a space that is just allocated for talking about the content that they just experienced? Can you usher them into a different part of the foyer space where it's just a reflection space where no one's allowed to talk? They can sit there, but the rule is that you're not meant to talk to each other in that space. So you can have some white space to think about what you just experienced and craft your own story in your mind. Uh, and you can start to walk around your venue then and you can start to pinpoint areas and go, actually this corner that I thought was wasted space, that's an interesting little nook for us to set up a business lounge where we can have networking. This could be our little biophilia space because it's got windows and it opens out onto a garden. Okay, I can start to play with this. And it's back to my early point. You got to zoom out of the individual moments that you're mm -hmm. scheduling within the programming and start to think, okay, what is the narrative? What is the story here? And how might these different locations help to enhance that and give me opportunities? to leverage these kinds of immersive experiences and technologies and weave it into the story that we're trying to tell as well. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, a lot of you who've taken the CMP exam or if you haven't, you know, we hear a lot about goals and objectives, goals and objectives. And remember, you know, events don't have goals and objectives. People have goals and objectives. Like at every single human who you've invited, who's paid a fee, generally it's paid, or even if it's free, they have expectations and they need to be met. We need to have them as activated as possible to get to that desired change behavior. So as one of my dear friends, Joanne Dennison always said, you have to sit in the attendee's chair. You have to walk the space and think about not just that you send them a link, they buy a ticket. Like if that's desired change behavior, how are you using that email, that direct mail piece? How are you using your social media to tell the story, to convince them? What is the bold promise that you're saying? You know, we've all heard it, you know, kids of the eighties and nineties, it's the movie event of the season. It's the unmissable summer blockbuster. Oh, is it? Okay. Take my money. I want to go see that. I want to be a part of that. Um, how many people bought HBO to watch the last season of Game of Thrones because they didn't want to be the only person who hadn't seen it, right? Didn't want to be the you know, person missing it. These are the types of things. It's like, I promise you something to get desired behavior, but you as the planner walk through the space. What are people looking at? What are they seeing? What are they touching? How far do they have to walk? How many opportunities do you have to help them you know, follow the yellow brick road, to see something on a mirror, to see a vinyl on the floor, um, to, are there greeters? Uh, I think it's back to IMAX, I think it was last, last year, one of the entrances had old fashioned um, uh, actors who were like photographers, like, oh my God, you're here and taking pictures. It was like paparazzi and so glad and you're like, you know, all of a sudden it was like, oh, I'm special. I have no idea what just happened. It was maybe three seconds of 
hype and you walk into the event already feeling like maybe maybe I'm special maybe something special is going to happen because they had to fill a very large space between where you got dropped off from the bus and where you actually entered the event so walk through that space and think about where are all of my opportunities and again they don't necessarily have to cost more money but if you're already spending it how can you allocate it in a way that it has the most impact on that desire change behavior and sometimes you may be just reading to you know reallocate a little bit and figure out how to spend the money to be most impactful. And if you can measure how impactful that is, all of a sudden you'll find that your budgets are more aligned with the event itself because you can show its value in how it's changing that behavior. You can measure its value in meeting those KPIs. And that's where you start to allocate and make yourselves more trusted advisors within your organization, because now you're the active tool towards meeting all of the organization's goals. You're not just the people who pick out the napkins. Like we're trusted advisors within our organization. So take that step up and use some of these tools to, to really ascend to that role and ensure that you can be as effective as possible. I love them. I, also, I remember the paparazzi too. See? That was so fun, right? Just like, like oh, what's happening? You. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, those unique touches. I love that. That yeah, are memorable. Um, awesome. So moving more into, I guess, digital. How can technology enhance immersive experiences without you know overshadowing the story that you create and the event design? Sir, this one is your wheelhouse. <laughs> I I yield the floor to the gentleman from Toronto. <laughs> it's, the, it's it's the softball question for me, right? Because it's my space, and I and I'm I've been talking about this for years, ranting and raving. Uh, the the key to a su all successful technology deployment, whether you're in events or any other form of technology in the world, is putting that user at this you know the center, human centered activation of that technology and so to your point how, how do we make sure it doesn't get in the way or overshadow uh you, you do that with a lot of intention and you start to ask each other the questions okay what might be what's called in the tech world the friction points that limit the people from participating in that technology whether it's their knowledge of the tech whether it's their device uh, whether it's accessibility to wi-fi um, they, there are a bunch of things that are going to stop people from getting in there and that's when it starts to become a distraction if it's not a seamless experience where they can with 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 that technology reinforces and helps you tell the story be very critical of if the technology should be there and should be activated in that way um, some examples of stuff that you know we all love i'll give you uh, probably the cheapest one that most people can do with their digital signage um, it takes a little bit of work to get your content right but just turn your monitors portrait don't do them landscape um, it's just, it just does something. I, I, I've been waiting almost 10 years now for this thing to wear off, but there's something about the portrait. And now that all of our devices are doing portrait style videos, it just, it does something. It immediately captivates us and still will for a few more years. So that's free. Flip it on its bracket, create your content in that way. You, you'll start to do it with that. Projection mapping has been huge. We love it because you can get a lot of bang for your buck, especially if you have control over the light. Uh, we all know all, uh, virtual reality is a bit of a non-starter because there's some ick factor to putting the headsets on, but talk about immersing someone in the middle of a story. Um, we often put on, not as often as we probably could, we put on our VR headset to play some games at home. And I mean, there's nothing like that feeling, like you are right there in it. Um, augmented reality though is really blowing up right now. If you haven't started playing with augmented reality, get in there because what a storytelling tool this can be um, to really enhance, provide additional content. And the little brother of augmented reality was second screen technology feels like it's ancient now but we're starting to finally see people activate the second screen technology correctly it's not just a mirror of what's on the main stage screens it's additional content it's additional color it's examples so that that presenter can provide the data limit the amount of content on their screens but that individual participant who cares about the minutiae and wants to get into the details like me 
I can zoom in and I can navigate that second screen content to get even more enrichment from what they're presenting. Uh, that can be done with augmented reality as well. But your starting point is if you have an app, leverage the hell out of that to, to provide that content and then use your data afterwards to answer the question, okay, we've activated mm -hmm. the app, we provided the content, here's what people engaged with, here's how it told the story, and here's how we're gonna measure that the people heard the story and that they mm -hmm. actually changed their behavior because of it. Anything, yeah, yep. sure, anything you wanted to add, Devin? Yeah. No, I, you know, I was thinking, um, I did an event at Disneyland a couple of years ago, and um, it, it was a very interesting and, and immersive event. And again, you know, we were technically in, in the park, but outside of the amusement. So it was very immersive. And of course there was an expectation that we have certain things at this event. So I got to call on our friends, Mickey and Benny to come and show up. And, um, but while interacting with the Disney friends, um, they said, oh, well, if you download the app, it'll give you some more information. I'm like, oh, of, of course there's an app for that, but there's a specific app to the park. And it's not just a map and it's not just a wayfinder. It is a story. It is, oh, you're waiting in line. You're probably going to pull this out while you're waiting oh we have specific games you can play and interact with other people who are waiting in line to do the same thing so we're still engaging you in our story we're still measuring how long are you waiting in line how long have you played the app while you're waiting in line for that ride oh we probably like it's all about data but it's something as simple as if you're going to use it to alleviate boredom because this is what we all do now we can't be bored for more than three seconds it's you have this as an active tool, what are you using to allow people when they're at least gonna whip this out, what are they doing with it that gives you data to make you more effective? And I think that just goes towards measurement is how are you measuring change behavior? What is the actual um, you know, KPI of that event? And it's if they need to learn something, well, you can't ask them at the end of the day, did they learn something? You also need to ask them in three months or six months, did you learn this and are you employing it? Are you employing it and are you seeing a difference? Like you have to remember that um, if it's a skill set, did you use the skill? How are you using the skill? Is the skill effectual to you? Oh, you met people. Are you still connected with those people? And reminding yourself, it's not just, did you have a good time at the event? Yeah. Because yeah. that is so subjective. And yes, it's important. That immediate return on investment, yes. Did you enjoy it? Because it means at least the event was positive. But measurement has to happen in increments after as well. And that's where you can show how the event created value for your organization. And that's one of the narratives that's the most important. Not just whether or not it was enjoyable, because that might not be the right metric. Is did it get to that desire change behavior? And those metrics are outcomes that a lot of our CEOs and our VPs and our higher ups like to see is not the process, which was did was the event nice? Did it look nice? Did it smell nice? Did people eat food? Did they dance or whatnot? It's hey, look at all these outcomes. Look at all these things that we measured and we put them in charts. We put them in graphs and we're like here's all this data. And now we can show it creates value. This is now the foundation for additional value. And then you look further out at the end of your strategic plan, at the end of your um, fundraising cycle, at the end, you know, whatever the end point is and say, if that's where we need to get to, we took a baby step today, what's that next step? And what's that next step? And you can start to see the stepping stones appear ahead of you. And then you design for each of those additional stepping stones. You take what worked, you maybe employ it again, you figure out where your friction points were, what didn't work, and then you design for those friction points and you keep pushing that forward you can tell we're design nuts right we are absolute, absolute geeks for design and and well, let's bring it all the way back to your initial point we talked about storytelling yeah. from 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 the get-go one of the key attributes over the last decade or more in marketing and product development in particular agile product development is the idea of story points so it's even in the name and, and really what Devin's talking about, there's this intentionality behind the design, both the process and what you design that allows you to zoom out and see that context and then say, mm -hmm. okay, what are my points along this journey that this participant's going on and how will I do all these things we've been talking about? How will I use storytelling at key points? How will I immerse them in, in an emotional, emotive experience? How will I at key points along that way measure against my KPIs. And if you map that journey out and you really allocate the, those different moments, you start to mitigate the risk inherent in innovating with them and doing things mm -hmm. differently. But if you, if you haven't got it down on paper and you can't articulate it to your boss and you're just willy nilly experimenting, you might get away with it for a little bit, but 
eventually you're going to have a bad time. So approaching things with a bit of a design mindset, learning some of those design skills and starting to adopt this sort of zoom in, zoom out uh, attitude to, to, to designing experiences and events is going to serve you really well long, long, long into the future. And, you know, a lot of you said in that original poll that engagement and time or yeah. engagement and budget or engagement budget time, right? It's our favorite triangle of, of problems. But what Anthony just said is that a lot of us are shooting blanks in the dark, hoping to see something that sticks. That's a waste of your time. That's a waste of your resources. And then what we get tagged with often is that events don't work. Events don't work. And I'm not going to spend more budget on that. Why am I going to have all this money on production? You need to be able to articulate the value of everything that you are designing to bring to the table. You want to save time? Design first. Think about what those goals are. Think about what you need to do for each of those key stakeholders. Be in alignment with the VP or your CEO, whoever owns the event. Make sure you're on the same page. Because oftentimes, many of us show up and I know I always ask show of hands and you can put it in the chat has anyone ever done a hundred hours of work and you get to the event and it looks awesome and you think it's great and someone from the higher up shows up and says what is this that's not at all what I thought why is that there why are we what like you know and all of a sudden they're in confusion and no matter what no matter how amazing that event is to one of your key stakeholders that event is already starting off on its back foot or better yet is already starting as a failure so even if you take 15 to 20 minutes to make sure that everyone is aligned on what is the purpose, why are we doing this, who are we doing it for, those small, small questions can make sure you're in alignment on how much time you're spending on it, how much budget you actually need to be effective, how much time you do need from certain teammates, stakeholders, from your event owner to validate the process along the way. This will align how you spend your time. This does become the lens that you look through when you spend money, when you allocate budget. You look through the lens and say, does this get us to our ideal outcomes? No. Nope. Thank you for that wonderful idea. We're going to put it on the shelf for now. It's a great idea. It's just not the great idea for right now. And then you have these two lenses to ensure you're already engaging your audience, you're spending your time effectively, that you're always working towards that overarching aim of the event. And you'll find that the time and the budget and the engagement constraints start to fall away and into an architecture that allows you to be as effective as possible. Amazing. Anything? Yeah, two thumbs up to that. <laughs> no, I love it. I'm still... I'm still in awe when you mentioned Disney World. I feel like that is like such a great example of immersive experience, that alone, just the production and just the story that they create, especially the digital and connecting with people. That one, I'm still in awe. I'm like, yeah, great. And I everything think. touches it. Look at the trash cans anywhere you're time in an immersive experience. I guarantee you the trash cans meet the theme. I guarantee you that outfits or the, so the costumes of everyone who works in that space from every server to every janitor, custodian, all goes into that space. Yeah. Right. If you think about a uh, Disney has a fantastic language from from a perspective of human beings, which is there are no employees at Disney and any of the Disney family. You're either on stage or you're backstage. Yeah. And so the perspective is we're all working towards creating positive experiences for people who come into our world. Mm -hmm. And your job is to be a part of the cast. Think about just how that one word changes how you who's employed for that would change your behavior to say, my, I, my job is different. I'm not, you know, I'm not just anything. It's like, I'm a cast member and I have a role to play. And this, just the change of that mindset. Imagine how if you could do the same thing for your attendees, just by immersing them with like two small changes of words. I didn't spend any money just now. I just changed the words, which changes your perspective. Yeah. I love it. Um, uh, is there any other additional, emerging technologies or trends that you guys see that's shaping the future of immersive events and event design that, you know, event professionals should be on the lookout or could help them measure, you know, uh, the metrics as well. I think we've touched on a lot of them, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the key ones, in particular, the affordable ones. Um, I, I, I think we're going to see, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to see more of uh, questioning. We spent a long time vilifying the device, um, saying it was the enemy. If only I could get people to put their phones down. Uh, the great distraction, we called it. Um, and mm -hmm. I think we've come to terms with the fact now, in particular, as we go through additional generation change, where removing the device from the equation is not possible 
and it is probably a bad idea. Uh, there's the term uh, nomophobia, which is actually the fear of being separated from your device. It has a, it has a clinical term now. Um, so I think the big thing we're going to see is how do we use this device in a way that's not intrusive, that, yeah, it's data driven, but it's not exploitative. Um, as in we're not harvesting data to do, you know, untoward things with it afterwards. And how does we, how do we make sure that this thing really elevates the experience, not to the early points detract away from it. So I think if you're going to be looking at any of the technologies that everybody has in their pocket, this is one to do some research into, but three things, I think we've touched on all of them. Storytelling, just research, 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 read stories, look up frameworks, connect with us on LinkedIn and see the storytelling we do and bug us for more books because we, we, so many books. A lot. we have so much content for you outside of this, this webinar, um, design, get it on paper. If you, if you can't articulate your story, you can't explain it to the executive, then you're going to have a hard time. Um, a great example recently, I, I, I sat down in the boardroom with an executive leadership team. We delivered the event design after many, many weeks of crafting it. Uh, and we got to the Q and A portion after the presentation and everyone was silent. They all said that that's just brilliant. Let's move ahead. And, and my client was like, oh my God, like no one had questions or anything. I don't, I don't know if that went well. I said, what are you talking about? It went great. They just signed off on everything. We're moving forward. So and that's because we had it down on paper. We had the story straight and we had it articulated. And then I think the third for me is just make space for humans, right? Get out of the way from time to time. Don't overstack your programming, bring some biophilia in, connect with us after this. If you want some more information on that, but remember human first, um, the technologies can come later. Um, and, and by design always Devin. Yeah. I, and you know, Again, Anthony and I are open books. Please, please, please connect with us. LinkedIn, send us messages. Um, Anthony and I are both voracious readers and happy to show you our nerdy bookshelves right now um, of things that have have added to our skill set, that have added to our ability to add this design language to you. Um, we're both uh, certified event designers. Anthony and I are both repping our, our CED pins right now. Um, Anyone who's interested in becoming more of an event design nerd, please reach out to us. I did drop the link in the in the chat, but you can um, email Anthony and I as well. But really, it's all about how you spend your time. Great design, great storytelling, great immersion is not more time, but it's how you spend the time that you have. So many of us waste hours and hours in that 100 hours up to meetings and then have to do more work because we got nothing. Imagine if you had a great framework to say, this is what we want to achieve. And if that's always top of mind, if that's always on paper, you have that goal the whole time. You can see the flag at the top of the mountain and you'd be surprised how all of those concerns that you have about time, about about budget and about engagement can fall into place. And again, it doesn't have to cost more money. It just costs a little bit of your willingness to change your behavior first and then just see the magic that happens after. And again, everything is always by design. And if anything should ever go wrong at your events, it is not a failure. It's just a design flaw. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Nice little touch. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we're approaching time. Um, but I just want to say a huge thank you to Devin and Anthony. Thank you for your insights and for joining us today. Hope everyone had a great time. Quick reminder that this session has been recorded and a video replay will be sent out to everyone who registered and a recap article will be live next week to go over all of today's highlights, um, along with any Q and a that you sent, if we didn't get answer to it. Um, so look out for that and thank you again for your time. And I hope everyone has a great week. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Happy designing.